everyone, and, and thanks for the chance to come to Machachi. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Lou. I'm kind of glad that you ended up giving my introduction there. I was a little bit, uh, well, I guess, concerned when uh, Lou gives this wonderful presentation, of course, about climate change and the challenges there, and then I get a chance to come up and talk to him about the fact that I represent an organisation with about 3.5 million tonnes of CO2 emitted every year. Um, so there's certainly some challenges there um, for me to try and follow up and suggest a uh, a little bit about what we might be trying to do to uh, have less of an impact in that regard. Um, I'm only going to talk to you today really about um, the journey we've been on at New Zealand over the past couple of years. We've really tried to change our approach to sustainability uh, and the role that we play, I guess, within New Zealand to a certain extent. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about what we're doing as much as why are we doing it and, and, and what's our thinking in that regard, and then a little bit about what I guess I've learned over the past couple of years um, sort of three key learnings uh, in terms of how we've gone about implementing some of the things that we're trying to do. Um, by no means are we anything like the finished article. Um, we're a long, long way from that. Um, but hopefully this just gives a sense for the, the type of approach that we're taking. Um, so the first point I've got here really is around why um, sustainability at, at Air New Zealand. And, and as hopefully a lot of you know, um, over the past year, we've been um, celebrating our 75th anniversary, um, which has been a really fantastic milestone, and, and lots of people have gone through both to Papa and, and the Auckland Museum looking at the exhibition that we've had in place. But for those of us close to that, we spend, have spent a lot of time looking through the archives, been involved with different projects, um, communicating different activity that's been in place. But the one consistent thing you see when you look at Air New Zealand's involvement, when you go to the exhibition, is just this fundamental connection to New Zealand through the years. We absolutely ride the highs and lows of the nation um, in so many different ways and, and whether that be really massive uh, events that have occurred through time um, that then become part of the nation's history like Erebus would be or riding um, I guess more superficial highs like a, a Rugby World Cup victory, whatever it might be, in New Zealand's always involved and of course economically that's even more so. So typically New Zealand goes pretty well financially when New Zealand goes well and, and, and of course the opposite applies. So, for us, we've got this massive, constant connection to New Zealand that is fundamentally important to our long-term success. And our ability to, to respond to that in the future um, really will determine our success for a long period of time. The other point I'll make is that 75 years, of course, gives us quite an interesting uh, backward-looking kind of time period. So um, often we hear about you know, climate change projections, looking out to, typically looking out to 2100. Um, of course, that seems like this sort of infinitely long period of time for a lot of people, but for us, when we reflect back 75 years, it doesn't feel like it's that long. We can look, look at images, we can look at the first flight that took place uh, back 75 years. Of course, looking out 75 years, we're at, we're at 2091. Now it's actually um, pretty close to those projection periods. And so some of that stuff starts to become a little bit more real for us when we uh, look at it in that manner. So a couple of reasons why the 75th anniversary um, has been important for us in, in, in the way we look at things. And so at New Zealand, we have um, this one-page summary of our business strategy. Um, I'm not going to go into it into any detail. Christopher Luxon introduced this when he became the CEO. Um, but what he put and what we put into the, the top line there, as you can see there, is this idea of our significance to supercharge New Zealand's success economically, socially, and environmentally. And that's very much the kind of program that we've put in place from a sustainability perspective. We don't tend to use sustainability a huge amount internally as a word. It's more around what's our role within... Uh, New Zealand uh, as a country. And so I'll, I'll, I'll try and go through a little bit of what we're doing there because that's fundamentally what our, our program is about. So over the past couple of years, we've spent a lot of time trying to frame up what does it actually mean? What does supercharging New Zealand six, success mean? And, and how would we turn that into some kind of meaningful program uh, of activity that, in particular, our people at Air New Zealand can understand, can relate to, and can get involved with? as well as being able to communicate it externally, have it reported against those types of things, which is really, really important, um, obviously, for us as an organisation. And, and this is, um, it seems really simple, but actually took quite a long time and, and, uh, and required quite a lot of thinking to even get to a relatively simple piece uh, like that. There's certainly, um, as any of you have worked in large corporates know, there's, there's lots of people with lots of opinions about lots of things. So um, getting into any kind of um, singular kind of one-page state is quite an uh, interesting challenge. Um, so there's three kind of pillars, as we see with most sustainability activity, a social, and environmental, and, and, and an economic uh, component to it. And the way that we've broken that down within uh, is, is, is into six areas. So um, in the social 
kind of pillar there. The first one is around our people. So essentially being a world-class employer. And so that's things like we've got a target to have 40% of our senior, or at least 40% of our senior leadership team female by 2020. We've got big um, health and safety targets. Um, We've got diversity targets and support across the, the, the um, company and, and then engagement targets. That kind of thing is what we've looked at primarily uh, there. The second one is about our communities, the way in which we interact with uh, primarily New Zealand communities and the role that we can play there. And to be fair, this is probably the area that we find hardest to define uh, and have uh, influence around. But we've done a bit of research to try and get a sense for what New Zealanders and in New Zealanders think about that. And so we're doing a bit of work there. But that's things uh, for us like we do a lot around uh, disaster relief and response to, you know, to crises in the Pacific. Um, we've, we're increasingly looking at things like environmental education and the role that we can play there. Um, you might have seen recently we announced a new Airpoints for Schools program, giving the chance for, for schools to receive Airpoints. Um, so there's a lot there. And one of the big pieces, and, and, and Lou touched on this, uh, is an increased focus around uh, Māori culture and the way in which we can have a greater uh, impact there uh, reintroducing, I would say, to a certain extent, Māori culture back into the organisation, particularly from an uh, internal and customer engagement perspective, as well as potentially partnering with, with iwi groups in different forms, which we do a little bit of currently through the partnership with DOT, but there's much more we can do in that space as well. So that's the kind of communities piece. The environmental side is much easier for us to define and kind of much harder for us to um, really, really nail to a certain extent. I'll talk a bit about carbon at the back end of the presentation, um, but it's, it's clearly the biggest single issue for us as an airline, and so there's a lot that's happening uh, there, and I'll talk about that at the end. Um, Lou's touched on our partnership with DOC, and, and for us, biodiversity uh, and our contribution to New Zealand's nature is a really important part of the story, and, and this comes back to the idea of supercharging New Zealand's success in a, in a kind of holistic way. So when I go overseas, people talk to me, you're an airline, why are you talking about biodiversity for? It's all about carbon. You know, you're just going to get distracted if you do that. And that's kind of fine. Um, if you're just an airline, but we kind of see ourselves as being a little bit more than that. The connection to New Zealand is so fundamental to us. Um, the role that, that tourism has within, within the uh, country and the, and the role that nature plays with the New Zealand tourism experience means that we have to look at things more holistically. And so the partnership with DOC um, is a really, really important part of that for us. And that's why we've got a partnership that's based on tourism properties, but is all really based on uh, our ability to make a contribution to conservation within those sites and then enable New Zealanders and foreign visitors to have an interaction that hopefully uh, is more engaged from an, a, a straight conservation perspective. And the other thing that we bring to the table, and Lou touched on this there, is the strengths that we can obviously bring to the table that DOC will struggle with. And the biggest single one there that we have over DOC, of course, is, uh, I guess, marketing skills and outreach uh, through the channels that we have. And so the ability to get people talking and thinking about conservation in a way that feels more real and accessible uh, because of the nature of our brand is a really important part that we can play, and, and hopefully we're, we're doing that reasonably well. Um, in the economic space, you know, this is a lot more standard kind of practice, obviously, for us as a business, but huge role within tourism. A key part, though, that we're looking at there is not just the kind of growth components, but what is the role that we can play in terms of ensuring that there's a sustainable tourism development plan for the country. So we know that tourism uh, has either become or is just about to become the largest foreign exchange unit for New Zealand again. Um, and that growth's fantastic from an economic perspective for the most part. Um, but obviously it brings some real challenges in terms of environmental and social impacts and how do we ensure that actually those negative benefits aren't realised but the positive economic benefits are. And so we're trying to figure that out at the moment. We don't have a, a real handle on it but we're doing quite a lot of um, work internally and then ultimately with a sector to try and figure out what that might look like. Um, and then the final piece there, trade and enterprise. A lot of that's really about how we interact with New Zealand business, showcasing... New Zealand products and services on board, uh, and in particular working with our supply chain overall to improve their uh, social and environmental performance. And we've, we've reintroduced a, a far more advanced supply code of conduct, and we're now forming joint business plans with um, a lot of our really key and large suppliers around what can we do in that particular space. So that's a real summary, really quick summary of the, of the framework. There's lots of um, sort of data and action that sits in behind that, but I wanted to give you a sense of for what we're talking about there in a pretty holistic kind of form. So I just want to quickly touch on, on three kind of things that we um, have kind of learned, I guess, through the journey that we've been on over the past couple of years, um, and the way in which I'd compare that to probably other New Zealand businesses, in particular New Zealand corporates, um, and where I think we've probably learned some things that, that could be used elsewhere. 
And the first from a corporate perspective is that I think what happens often in the sustainability space is that people kind of get into this kind of box ticking exercise where they're just trying to um, almost meet as many things within the sort of GRI reporting framework or, or elements like that as possible. Um, but the key challenge really, I think, is to fundamentally understand the organisation that you're a part of um, and respond in a way that makes sense for the story and the brand and the culture of that particular organisation. And so for us, obviously, carbon's a really important part, but obviously we're, we're more than, we see ourselves as more than just an airline, you know, so we, we've been New Zealand's most preferred employer, we're most trusted brand, we've got this long-term connection to the country in a way that's so fundamentally important. There's so many parts to what Air New Zealand means for New Zealand that we have to come at it from a more holistic kind of viewpoint. So that's a really important piece for us to ensure that um, we build a program that represents what we are. Now that'll be different if you're united uh, overseas as a different airline or Qantas or somebody else in the same way that it's different if you're the ANZ or the BNZ or Fonterra or, any, or anyone else as well. And, and I think that's a really, really important part is to understand what the organisation is fundamentally about to drive a program that pe people can engage with. The second one I've got here is this, this concept of using insight to develop the program, particularly sort of customer and employee insight. And so we've done this program where um, we've spent a lot of time going out and talking to our employees in particular about what do you guys expect of Air New Zealand? What does supercharging New Zealand success look like? What do you think we should be doing in this kind of regard to drive forward a program that makes a bit more sense than um, would otherwise be the case? And so um, I've put a graph up there, which is probably not the, the nicest way to show it, but we spend a lot of time talking to our, customer, uh, to our staff in particular. We've run about 20 workshops. We've done big online programs to understand what do you guys reckon we should do. For us, the, the ability to contact and, and speak to the employees and get them engaged and involved with the program has been fundamentally important. So that research has really uh, impacted um, some of the things that we've, we've been putting in place over the last year or so. Um, the next point I'll just start talking to now is um, the power of external engagement really. One of the things that we've done that hasn't really been done so much in New Zealand previously is try and pull together a lot more external feedback around the program that we're putting in place. So um, we've introduced a, an external advisory panel um, which has six people on it, the people on the screen uh, here now, and, and they meet about four days a year in total but provide us a lot of advice in between periods as well to try and challenge us to be the best that we can be. And, and previously we'd, we'd probably um, developed a program that was a little bit sort of inside out and therefore didn't have the aspiration that we need to. So um, this panel, which Christopher Luxon and, and David Morgan, who's our Chief of Flight Operations, also sit on, um, comes together to really challenge us in the program that we put in place. So Jonathan Porritt, um, real global leader in sustainability uh, action, worked with a lot of corporates, developed a um, couple of NGOs and, and just done a really a million different things uh, in this space, but a strong connection to New Zealand because his dad was Lord Arthur Porritt, the first New Zealand-born Governor General. Anne and, and Rob, many people here uh, would know uh, well. we have got a biofuels expert in Suzanne Hunt from the US. We've got the Chief Economist of IATA and, and Derek, uh, probably a lot of people here know. Also, just to try and drive us forward in ways that we wouldn't otherwise do uh, if we did things internally, and I think that's helped uh, massively for us. Um, I'm going to finish, really, by talking a little bit about aviation and some of the action pieces, because obviously, um, standing up here and talking about a program without referencing the carbon components, um, not a fantastic approach. Um, the, the aviation sector, I mean, it's, an, it's an interesting one um, in that uh, largely excluded from, from things like the Paris negotiations as shipping is because international activity occurs between borders and, and that's why uh, it's largely been left out. Um, and so it's, it's fairly been challenged and actually was a pretty slow uh, sector, I would say, to get moving around climate change. Uh, but over recent periods, that, that's ramped up quite a lot. Uh, and the, ta the sector has three major targets currently, and I think these will probably end up getting made more aggressive in the future. The first one, is, and the, the one that's currently in place, is a 1.5% annual fuel efficiency gain uh, through until 2020. Uh, it's, that's being exceeded quite comfortably. For example, in, in New Zealand, we've made about a 20% uh, improvement on a per passenger basis in carbon emissions uh, in the past decade. The second target is carbon neutral growth from 2020, which is a, uh, essentially capping emissions at the 2020 level uh, from that point in time. And then the third target is a 50% reduction in carbon emissions uh, by 2050 versus the 2005 baseline. Now, those are um, targets that uh, are, are pretty aggressive for aviation. They might not necessarily relates to some of the challenges that we face globally with regards to climate change, but um, for aviation, 
end up in a, in a space which is already highly efficient and, and therefore pretty challenging uh, to move on. The three key ways in which those targets get achieved um, really are around, primarily around technology gains in the first instance. So uh, a 787, for instance, that we've got is about 20% more efficient than a 767 that it replaces. Uh, there's also lots that's done around the way in which the aircraft operated air traffic control, uh, different technology uses on the ground, um, that kind of thing. So that's a really big piece for us in the fundamental program of, of, I guess, any carbon plan for an airline. The second part is biofuels, um, which were you know, really considered a, a great hope a few years ago, uh, but have got much, much more challenging uh, to come to fruition. There's been a lot of uh, activity, particularly internationally, where there's a lot more incentives in place. Um, we're starting to see some, some biofuel uh, produced and provided for airlines, but very, very low levels currently, and, and of course not helped by um, massive slump in, in, in the oil price, which has meant that a lot of those businesses have struggled to, to stay across the line um, financially. But that's something we're looking at really closely. We're about to have an RFI go out to market uh, to try and drive some of that, go some of that forward. Uh, and we're also uh, looking at some international offtake opportunities there as an airline ourselves. But that's a big one, and that's really seen as, as probably the second biggest lever in terms of hitting that 2050 target if biofuels can come to fruition. Uh, and then the third one is offsetting, uh, which is uh, obviously the sort of the last resort approach in many ways, but something that, we, again, we, we're trying to get a lot better at. The 2020 target of carbon neutral growth will largely be achieved through a global offsetting uh, program, and that's currently in negotiation uh, internationally at, at the International Civil Aviation Organization, trying to figure out how a global uh, market-based measure for carbon can be implemented that enables that target to be hit. So that's essentially the aviation ver version of the Paris uh, discussion. So that's um, a really key part um, for us. We're trying to figure out in the New Zealand context how do we do offsetting better in a way that drives better environmental outcomes for biodiversity and waterways, you know, topsoil, everything, rather than just the standard uh, exotic forestry approach that currently exists, but it's um, not, not an easy thing. And then for Air New Zealand specifically, um, we also invest in climate science through Antarctica New Zealand, the New Zealand Antarctica Research Institute, as, a, as essentially a fourth pillar of, a, of our program, recognising the important role that New Zealand scientists play uh, on the ice. And, and Lou obviously touched on that uh, in his talk. So that's um, it's a really quick summary of, of where we're at. Um, I'm con conscious that I haven't spoken so much around what we're actually doing, and, and I'm happy to uh, talk about, about that over lunch. Uh, so, um, yeah. <laughs>